Good morning. My name is Peter, and I'm one of the ministers on staff, and I have the privilege of bringing this morning's message to you. We all want authentic relationships. The characteristic of these kind of relationships is that we're interacting with people who mean what they say and say what they mean. They practice what they preach, and when they say to us they love and they care about us, they actually demonstrate that day in and day out. In fact, our best relationships, those with our spouse, our family, our children, our colleagues, our best friends, our relationships that have the ring of authenticity to them. We even want our political leaders and our religious leaders to say what they mean and mean what they say and practice what they preach. It's very important for us that we are in these kind of relationships because they provide security and belonging and trust and safety. Jesus came to save us from our sins, but he also showed us what it was like to live our life of faith for the world to see, and he did that in an authentic way. And because he was so capable of practicing what he preached, he would often get in trouble with the religious leaders. And we've just finished a series of sermons where we have seen this latest clash that Jesus has had with them. It began when Jesus got on a donkey and rode into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover on what was the last week of Jesus' life. When Jesus was riding in on the donkey, it meant that he was saying to the people that he is the spiritual king of the nation. And the people were so excited that Jesus might be the Messiah that they hailed him as the son of David. They said, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were so excited to have him come into their city. Jesus went into the temple, and when he arrived, he saw that the money changers were there, and they were swindling people out of the exchange of what it cost people to pay for the sacrifice that they were going to offer in the temple, and so he overturned their tables and he threw them out of the temple, and then he healed the lame and the blind. Well, this of course angered the religious leaders because they had a whole different religious system than what Jesus was teaching about, and so the next day when Jesus came back to the temple, these religious leaders approached Jesus and they demanded to know, by what authority do you do these things? Jesus didn't answer him directly. What Jesus did was give them three parables, And in these parables, Jesus explained to them that he indeed did have authority over them and he had the authority to act in these just and righteous ways. Well, that only angered them further. And so they sent a group of people to Jesus that had a series of questions. And when Jesus was done answering those questions, nobody dared ask him anything else because he had answered them so brilliantly. That's where we're going to pick up today. Jesus is going to change his attention from the teachers of the law and the Pharisees and talk to the crowds. And he is going to say some of the harshest words that are ever recorded in the New Testament that are going to be aimed right at these religious leaders. You would wonder why Jesus might do this. Well, when you think about this, it would be right for Jesus to expect that these religious leaders would have been the model of discipleship of their day. I mean, these are the men that studied the word of God day in and day out, and they memorized it and they taught it, but they didn't allow for the word of God to impact their lives. These were the men that would look through the scripture to find out what the heart of God would want them to know about God, about mercy and justice and taking care of the widows and the orphans. And they should have taken that heart of God on as their own heart, but they did not. And they were hard-hearted and lived in their own selfish and self-centered ways. You would also think that these men would demonstrate to the entire nation what it was like to walk by faith and not by sight. But they did not even do that. They turned away from faith and they walked according to their own tradition and their own understanding. You see, they ended up being exactly what a disciple should not be. And Jesus was angry about that. Matthew chapter 23 is divided up into three sections. And we're going to be taking a look at our attitude, how the word of God should impact our lives, and about how our own personal responsiveness to Jesus makes all the difference in the world. And we could spend our time talking about what not to be like, because Jesus spends a great deal of time condemning certain practices. 
but we're not going to do that. We're going to listen for what Jesus tells them about how they should live because he has put that in these three sections as well. And so we're going to hear the warning so that we're not that same way that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are, but we're also going to tune our ear to transformation this morning so that we can see what Jesus says we should be like so that we can be true and authentic followers of Jesus. So let's jump into the text. Our first characteristic of a true, authentic follower of Jesus is that the attitude of a Jesus follower is one of humility. Matthew chapter 23, verse 1. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to help them. Everything they do is done for men to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted in the marketplace and to have men call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have only one master and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called teacher, for you have one teacher, the Christ. The greatest among you will be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. These first 12 verses clearly show us that humility is a natural product of faith, and humility leads us to serve. Jesus is speaking to the heart condition of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, where their devotion to God led them to practices that drew attention to themselves instead of to God. C.S. Lewis described humility in the following way. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, it is thinking of yourself less. And when we think of ourselves less, then we will be able to serve people in a greater way. Our gratitude for being saved fuels our humility before the Lord, and we know that we can't save ourselves, and so out of this immense gratitude that we have been transferred out of death and into life, and the Holy Spirit lives within us, we gladly serve God, and we gladly serve one another without drawing attention to ourselves. To be humble means that we willingly place ourselves underneath the leadership of another. And what we found out from Michael's sermon two weeks ago is that we place ourselves underneath Jesus as our teacher, and then we learn about the authority of the word and the power of God to change us and to allow for us to be the kind of disciples that God wants for us to be. The religious leaders were unwilling to be humble in these ways. So why was Jesus so harsh with them? Well, first of all, these men sat in Moses' seat. This was a way to talk about their supreme authority. These were the men that got to tell all of the Jews how they should practice their own faith and live their lives in such a way that they would honor God. They should have known better because they had studied the Word of God, and they should have lived better and lived out the Word of God, but they did not. They were in error, and they taught people in error. The second point is that they drew attention to themselves instead of, as a humble person, living out their lives in such a way that it drew attention to God. You see, they wore phylacteries and and had tassels. The phylacteries were the little boxes that they would wear on their foreheads and on their left arms. And you might see this with Orthodox Jews. The phylacteries had a little scroll of scripture in them and they would put it on their forehead in order to literally demonstrate that they wanted the word of God in their minds. And they would put it on their left arm so that they could literally describe to people that they wanted it close to their heart, but we know that they did not let the Word of God sink into their head and into their hearts. These boxes would be larger and more ornate because after all, these were the religious leaders and the bigger the box and the more ornate that it was, the more important you should be. They also had longer tassels at the edge of their garments which would draw attention to themselves because they were more ornate, more colorful, more beautiful than what others, other people's were. They also loved being in the synagogue, sitting closest to the Torah. That was the best seat, the most favored place that they could sit in. And so they would come into the synagogue and they would demand that other people would leave that place so that they could sit up close to the law. Because after all, they were the teachers of the law and they deserved to be in that place of honor. 
And they also love titles. They love to be called rabbi and father or teacher. To be called father in that day meant that they were standing on the shoulders of their forefathers, the teachers that went on before them, and they were continuing on in their tradition. And instead of using this as a place of respect, these titles as respect, they used them to feed their egos. See, the conclusion of this section is that as disciples, we are to be humble and we are to serve each other. When we are proud and self-exalted, we become resistant to the Word of God and we don't understand it. We don't let the Word of God influence us any longer and we don't take into Jesus' uh, heart. We don't take into our heart Jesus' words and allow them to be applied to our lives. When we think that we've got faith figured out like the Pharisees thought they had, we actually become unteachable and resistant to God. See, humility is recognizing our rightful place as underneath Jesus, and we don't draw attention to ourselves in our service when we are in that place. The second characteristic of a Jesus follower is that a Jesus follower lives out the intent of Scripture. Jesus wants us to have an authentic faith. He wants us to have a faith that when it is lived out in the marketplace of ideas and when it is out and about in public, it makes sense for people. People see that God is living and active inside of us and that we bear the marks of God himself with the same attitudes and the same priorities and the same love and the same care that God himself would have. Verses 13 through 38 is the section that we're going to look at, and it is divided up into seven woes. We often refer to this as the seven woes of the Pharisees. The use of the woe in language at that time was fairly common, and it would be familiar to the Jews of that day. And when we see this word, it is a little bit unfamiliar to us. So as we go through this passage, I want you to hear that A woe is like a heavy sigh. It's kind of like a lament, a wailing of the heart. It's about somebody who feels like things have gone terribly wrong, and it hurts me and it grieves me. And it also is a warning, a warning to change behavior because there is an impending judgment. So as we move through these woes today, we're going to look at each one individually, and at the end, We'll make some application for our own lives. Woe number one. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, and you will not let those enter who are trying to. To shut the door of the kingdom in the face of the Jewish people meant that the religious leaders were opposed to Jesus in every way. They worked hard to discredit him. They were trying to kill him. They obviously talked poorly about him behind his back. I imagine that they were making threats to people who expressed an interest in Jesus and following him. They worked hard to make sure that Jesus' teaching just stopped and that nobody would follow him. And thus they shut the door to discipleship of Jesus and shut the door of the kingdom in the face of the people. Woe to, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. How would you like that to be your epitaph for how you train, model, and coach people? Oh, you're bad, but your disciples are even worse than you are. What Jesus is saying is that while he might admire their evangelistic zeal, These Pharisees are going out and they're making people more pharisaical than what they are themselves. So just think about that. In order to be a good Pharisee, you have to keep all of these extra rules on, on top of the law. And these disciples figured out that if I really want to be righteous and holy and good, then I need to keep every single one of these down to the most minute detail. And they worked really, really hard at it. And as a result, they completely missed the mark. And they made these Pharisees more Pharisaical than themselves. Woe three. Woe to you, blind guides. You say if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. And if anyone swears by the gold in the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools. Which is greater, the gold in the temple or that which makes the gold sacred? You also say if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. And if anyone swears by the gift on it, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? 
Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And he who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. To make this simple, what Jesus is simply saying is that we need to be a people who speak honestly. The Jews had this elaborate system of truth-telling because they lived in the same kind of world that you and I do, where, hey, I can tell a little white lie if I really want to, but right now I'm telling you the truth. Or I could deceive you on one hand, but if I tell you that I swear by the temple, by the gold in the temple, by the offering on the altar of the temple, I promise that right now I am telling the truth, Jesus is cutting through that entire system and simply saying to them, you must be people of integrity. You must tell the truth because God doesn't lie to us and we reflect him. He always tells us the truth. He always practices what he preaches and you must be the same kind of people. Be honest. Well, four, woe to you, teachers of the law, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. This is the most significant woe. It is the deepest sigh that Jesus gives. The Pharisees spent so much time trying to obey the 613 commandments and all of the extra rules that they placed on themselves and on the nation that they simply overlook the embodiment of God's love within the law. They missed justice, they missed mercy, and they missed faithfulness. Their own desire to be righteous down to the most minute degree actually caused them to miss God entirely. And they were unrighteous in the end. What Jesus is saying with this illustration of a gnat and a camel is that the gnat, which is an unclean, small, bug represents all of those little minutia rules that they have created like tithing an herb. How much of an herb is that? Very small. And it's not even something that the law commands. And so it's like a gnat. And because they're so busy straining out gnats, they don't see that they're neglecting the most important parts about the law. They're ignoring justice. They're ignoring mercy. They're ignoring faithfulness. It's like they're eating this massive camel and they don't even notice that they're eating it. And if you were to eat an unclean animal as a Jew, you would be unworthy to worship because God said, that's not what I want you to do. I want you to be holy and separate. And so what Jesus is actually saying is that while you are spending all of this time on all of your rules, you're actually becoming unworthy to worship God yourselves. You have completely missed the mark. Woe number five. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. We all know about parking lot conversions, don't we? Put your kids in the car, they're not doing so well, fuss all the way to church, pull on up, everybody puts on their best behavior, walks through the church doors. We all look really great in here, don't we? We look good, we smell good, our kids are all gonna behave because they're not in here with us, right? Parking lot conversions. Imagine living a life where you're always that way, where things aren't right on the inside, but you're pretending all around you that something is better than what it really is. What Jesus is doing is calling out the fact that these leaders need a transformation on the inside. They haven't been changed, but they look really good when they're phylacteries and their tassels and the way that they move among the people and they look clean and they look just, but in reality on the inside, they are not. They have negated God's word and their own tradition stand in the way of their faith. Woe number six. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear as people who are righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Well, during that time period, the Jews would whitewash all of the tombs the week before Passover. 
And this had already been done by the time that Jesus made this statement. The, Jew, the, the tombs would be whitewashed so that the visiting worshipers that would come from around the area or other countries would know to stay away from those particular areas because they would become unclean if they came in contact with a dead body. And so this was like a warning. Don't come here. This is a tomb area. And so they were clean. They were bright. They were easy to see. And what Jesus is saying is, you look clean and you look bright, but on the inside, you are actually corrupt. But he goes further to say this, the people who come in contact with you become corrupt and unclean also. Now, now we're fighting. Now Jesus is saying to them, even your teaching, your lifestyle, the way that you are living your life actually injures and damages and wounds people because you might look good on the outside, but on the inside, you are full of deadness. You're not filled with the word of God, the light of God, the love of God, the hope of God. You are filled with yourselves. You are contaminating faith and you are creating barriers to God. Woe seven. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our forefathers, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding of the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the sin of your forefathers. Jesus is calling out the religious leaders for their naive belief that if they lived in the olden days, the time of the prophets, that they would have been the ones that would have believed the prophets. And what is so incredibly ironic is standing right in front of them is the prophet of prophets. It is God incarnate, wrapped up in human form to teach and train and guide in righteousness, to show them how to live their lives. And you know what they're planning on doing with him? Kill him. You are just like, just like your forefathers, and I'm calling you out on it. You are guilty. Can you feel the sighing in Jesus' heart? Can you see the frustration that he sees? Do you hear the judgment in his voice? He expected better and more from his leaders. Do you hear the emphasis on living out the intent of Scripture as a priority in our lives? Well, before we leave this passage, we can easily be like the Pharisees of this section ourselves. We can hinder faith in Jesus. We can pass on ungodly traits to others. We can tell white lies or big lies and then swear that we're finally telling the truth when we're caught. We can forget the most important parts of our identity in Jesus, to love God and love others, to act justly, be merciful, and live faithfully. We can act right around certain people, but still need to be changed on the inside. We can hurt people in such a way that they become disheartened with the church, disheartened with Jesus, and turn away from God. We can think that we are not acting in hurtful, angry, stubborn, and unchristian ways when actually we're doing that and we have a blind spot. These are pretty serious charges. But Jesus also tells us how to avoid it, believe it or not. And we're going to take a look at that in this next section. We don't have to be this way. In fact, Jesus is saying, look at them and choose something else. But he's going to tell us how we can actually do that. So the third characteristic of a Jesus follower is to have a willing heart toward God. Just when you thought that it couldn't get any worse, Jesus uses even more harsh language. And he says this, you snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore, I'm sending you prophets and wise men and teachers. Some of them you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. I tell you the truth that all of this will come on this generation. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you are not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
we are looking at the end of hypocrisy, which is judgment. If we don't repent and change, judgment is inevitable. Jesus still loves his people. Remember, he loves the Pharisees. He made them. He is their God and creator. And he wants them to follow God, follow him. And yet they refuse. But he is not done yet. This is Jerusalem, and he's made a foreshadowing of the church. He said, I'm still going to send people to you. I'm going to send the apostles, and I'm going to send Christian people to you. And you're going to flog them, and you're going to run them out of the city, but I'm going to send them to you because I still want you to know about me. They also think that they're innocent of all wrongdoing. They are so hypocritical and so pompous that they can't imagine that they have ever done anything wrong. And so Jesus says to them, you will be guilty for all of the blood that has been shed on God's people from the beginning of time with Abel in the book of Genesis all the way to the end of the book of Second Chronicles, which was the end of the Hebrew Bible with Zechariah. All of them, all of the righteous people who are killed, you are guilty of because you are standing in front of me and you still reject. Why would he talk that way? Part of it is because he loves them so much. Sometimes we just have to be that direct. And part of it is he's frustrated. Part of it is that he's sighing. But he wants them to change. So why are they deaf to the mercy of God? Well, they are unwilling. You see, the key to growth and communication is willingness. Jesus lamented that Jerusalem wasn't willing to be open to God, and if they were, he would bring them to her as a hen gathers her chicks. Have you ever felt like a hypocrite? Maybe this morning. Have you ever felt like one or more of these woes would apply to you? Maybe this morning. Have you felt like you're too far gone for God to save you? Well, maybe this morning. Have you felt like you've sinned too much and that there is no more forgiveness left for you? Well, maybe this morning. Remember who Jesus is talking to. He's talking to Jerusalem, the people that are gonna kill him. And he says, I'm still willing. And if you wonder whether or not God is willing and if he actually would do that for you, let's just jump ahead a few days to the cross. We know that Jesus was in the middle and there was a man on his right and a man on his left. And one of those men was a thief who looked at Jesus and said, remember me when you go into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. You see, there was that much faith, just enough faith for Jesus to recognize that this man was reaching out to him and Jesus said, I will take you because you are willing and I'll take you where you need to go. So the question before us is, are you willing? Are you willing to let Jesus take you where he knows you need to go? Will you trust him? So I wanna give you three action steps today for your head, your heart, and your hands. The first is to know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that Jesus is willing. We can give testimony of that by many people in here, that Jesus will take you where you are to move you forward to where you need to go. The second with your heart is to have confidence that this is for you. Jesus is saying this to you, not to somebody else, but to you. And he is saying, take out, take those steps, move forward, just move to me, and you will see that I move to you. And then our hands, to end hypocrisy by humble service, to live out the intent of scripture as you understand it, and to move toward Jesus with your lifestyle will connect you with him in greater and deeper ways. You see, as a body, we do want to practice what we preach. We want an authentic faith that is a real faith. We want a faith for people to see that God is alive and well and makes sense in the world around us. And if we embrace these three great truths that Jesus has talked to us about today, our faith will come alive and we will be close to him. Around this room in the four corners are tables that are lit with a lamp. People are waiting at these tables to meet with you. This is your time to tell God that you're willing. This is your time to meet with somebody for prayer or to find out what your next steps are in your own faith journey so that you can move forward rather than be stuck don't just sit and say, I wish it was better. I wish God would do that. You have to move, and God will move with you. So make today the day you move. Make today the day that you act. Make today the day that you embrace Christ more fully. So let us hear the words of Jesus today and take them to heart.